anybody know what's going on Tuesday? Anything special happening this week? Nah. Uh, maybe. Election, huh? And, and I know that you, I, I, I would please continue to call you to pray for election, not just for the election, but also for our country as we, as we move into election, but also after election, that, that God would continue to move in all of our lives. Amen? Amen. But uh, today, I'm going, to, I'm going to step out on a really long limb today. You're going to have fun with this one, I'm sure. Um, hang with me, though, I promise. You'll, you'll like it. I promise you'll be happy with it. Um, today, I want to talk to you about religion and politics. Ooh, come on, collective. Oh, did he just say that in, in, in church? Oh, no. Yeah, you know, uh, here's the key thought that I want us to understand today. I put it up here. It's on the board. It says, can we agree to um, disagree politically and yet love unconditionally? Is that possible? It better be, Right. That's where, that's where I want to focus in today, and, and uh, so I wanted to just take a few minutes and share this with you. Um, it's, it's pretty difficult to stay away from the topic of religion in church, isn't it? That one's pretty tough. It is fairly easy to stay away from the topic of politics in church as a preacher uh, and, until that moment comes when politics and what Jesus has said collide, and then as a pastor, I tend to feel just a little bit compelled to talk about that. And, and what I want to talk about today is the division that is happening throughout our nation within the church created by this current political climate that we're going through. And, and as we begin to see the cultural diversity within our community, maybe within our church, uh, within our own personal lives, uh, sadly what's happening is it's going to try and divide us. And how many of you know that that's not what Jesus wants for us, right? Right? And, and so today I want to talk to you about that. Uh, it became very apparent to me uh, of, of that whole thing happening at the 2000 election, 2016 election, excuse me, 2016 election, the last one, um, in my last church. My last church, for those of you who don't know, my last church is down in Vallejo, California, which is in the Bay Area. It is very uh, culturally diverse. We, uh, no kidding, we have 25% uh, Latino, 25% African American, 25% are Asian uh, and 25% is our Caucasian in that church. And so we had a really wonderful collage and mix of different individuals. And how many of you know that when you bring that many cultures and that many uh, races and different things together, you're going to have a little bit of a conflict, right? It's okay to talk to me. It's okay. It's all right. And so I want to tell you a story about what, what happened uh, coming up to that election. Um, I had I had a... Um, a lady come in from our church into our lobby, and she was just beside herself. She was like, couldn't believe it. There was a white minivan parked outside of our church doors that, uh, that was covered with Trump stickers, and she was appalled by that. It just, it just outraged her and, in, and incensed her. She couldn't believe it. Now, I happen to know the owner of that car. Her name was Dottie. Dottie was about 86 years old, a retired minister, Caucasian, die-hard Republican, probably packed a gun, whether I'd like to admit it or not. Um, she wasn't on social media. She didn't, she didn't get into all of that, but what she did do was she made her social media her front yard and her vehicle, as most of that generation might have done, right? And that's how she expressed her political views. On the other side of that now, the other individual who was appalled was not Caucasian, uh, a young person and a die-hard Democrat, and that's okay, and, and she was all over social media and expressed her views as well, quite vehemently, but just in a different mode. Now, the younger social media techie person couldn't believe that we would allow anybody to park a vehicle out in front of our, our, our church with such vile stickers on their car. Um, it, just, it just couldn't believe it, which, incidentally, the closest parking to our front door was senior citizens, so <laughs> kind of wasn't going to do that. And she demanded that we have the car moved and, and prohibit such uh, displays from being parked near our front doors. She said it made her afraid. And I thought that was really interesting. You know, Dottie, on the other hand, saw this as she had always seen it. It was just her political expression, not wanting to cause fear in anyone, not to threaten, just to declare her opinions, just like anybody else does maybe on social media. But here's the point, okay? What one individual saw caused fear, all right? And, and, and what the other individual saw didn't. 
See, now, if we look at that today, we would say that Republicans have said, afraid of what, right? I don't understand that there's nothing to fear. But then the Democrats on the other side, and yes, I'm, I, I'm saying both of these, and you're going to hear me say these throughout, and I'm, I'm not going to pick on anyone but both of us, okay? Um, and and but on the Democrats on the other side, the individual saw this as a completely different way. It wasn't trying to cause any fear. It was just simply trying to do that, to express her political views. And what, what we found out is that nothing divides like politics, does it? Because nothing divides like fear. Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that that happens in our lives? Nothing divides like politics because nothing divides like fear. You can raise a lot of money, money peddling fear. Have you been watching TV lately? Here's, here's what, what each different party may say. Re Re Republicans are, are, are trying to take away your votes. If you'll send $25 today, we will help to make sure that doesn't happen. Democrats are trying to take away your guns. If you send us $50 today, we will make sure that we get to continue to carry our guns in your Second Amendment right. If the president is reelected, it's the end of the world. But send us $35 today, and we will be sure that we will make sure that this is going to happen. And, and, and if the socialist Democrat is elected, it's the end of the world. But send us $45 this week, and we will fight for our cause. Right? Am I the only one watching the TV ads? It's just amazing. If you peddle enough fear, you can raise a lot of money, can't you? Sometimes I wonder if that's where we're heading. The question is, what exactly do we fear? What do we fear? We fear loss. Have you thought about that? Really, what we fear is a loss. We fear a loss of, of opportunity. Maybe we fear a loss of control. Maybe we fear a loss of wealth. A loss of the future for our children. Maybe we fear uh, our, the loss of our culture if we're from a different culture. Maybe we fear the loss of freedoms in our lives or we fear our progress. Incidentally, I'm going to put a little pause there. It's funny because I, I, had, I prayed with the, um, the hosts and worship team and different ones ahead and I had a few after go, you're really going to talk on that today? And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to talk on that today. Give me a big spoon. I'm going to stir this pot up here. So, you know, white people... Here it is, we fear what might happen in this election. Uh, our black and brown brothers and sisters fear what has already happened in their lives. For them, it's not theory, it's actually history, and I wouldn't call it all that distant history. And for all of us, it's the fear of the unknown, isn't it? That's really what we get down to, and, and we can't raise very much money if nobody's afraid. But when we're afraid, we can raise a lot of money. So we're in this time in our culture when everybody is peddling fear and everybody is attempting to solve the problem through money. And the problem is, if we're not careful, we're going to fall victim to that. All right? The bigger problem is, if we're not careful, we're going to be divided by it. And that is the real problem. So back to my story. Can I jump back there for a minute? Is that all right? Okay, seeing the display of the two sides so adamant, you know, in what they were viewing, uh, I was a little shocked. I, I was a little surprised because I just didn't really, I, I hadn't really thought about it. Let me just say that if you're looking for a church where everybody agrees politically, well, then you're probably in the wrong place because I don't believe we should all agree on the same things. I don't think that's right. Uh, if you're looking for people who all agree with you, it's never going to happen because we all have opinions, don't we? And that's okay, right? Thank you. Those are good times to say right. I, I'm going to ask for those, all right? I have three kids. And within my family, I have three kids, and I have three different leanings politically within my family. I have my daughter, Tasia. Tasia, we adopted when she was six. She's mixed race. She's black and white and looks black, but she's black and white. And she has two beautiful mixed race children that are black and white as well. Um, and she, I would say, is Democrat-leaning in her, her views, and that's fine. Then I have my other son, Josh. Josh is a uh, police officer in Aurora, Colorado, right? Probably, I haven't seen the sticker yet, but I'm guessing he's NRA. Definitely a uh, concealed carry packing person. Um, and uh, he's, he's one who would be very apt to wear uh, maybe a Hillary Clinton shirt that doesn't put her in such a favorable light, if I could say that nicely. Right? Okay. So I, I have Teji, I have Josh, and then I have Caleb. Caleb is, is um, uh, I would call him an independent. Caleb loves social justice. 
fact, he's down in California, Southern Cal, working with undocumented families, helping them because he believes so much in social justice that he wants to make sure they have a fair shake at becoming a part of the United States. And he believes very strongly in that. He's passionate about it. All in one family. Is that amazing or what? And here's the really cool thing is, is that we actually get along. Can you believe that? Each one is very strong in their opinions, but we get along. And, and the spectrum of that is what we had in our church as well, uh, down in California. And I loved it, and I want to see that in any church I'm in because I believe it's really important that we have the ability to love each other unconditionally, right? See, we the church have an amazing opportunity to model for our community and our country what it looks like to disagree politically and love unconditionally. We have the opportunity to do that. And how many of you know that our country is not exactly uh, disagreeing politically and loving unconditionally? We disagree. That one's easy. We disagree politically pretty, pretty hard, don't we? But loving unconditionally is a little more difficult in our current climate situation, isn't it? And, and one question I have, actually, it's, I've got a bunch, but this is one I'm going to give you. Don't answer it out loud. Don't say amen. Don't cheer. Don't throw anything at me. None of that today, okay? So the, the thing is, is you probably think like I do. You think, I got this. I'm good at this. I got it. I'm fine. I can handle the, the whole thing, right? But like in my family, I want us to really dig down and face some things that maybe we've come face to face with before. Maybe we've not. And they may even make us a little uncomfortable and afraid. Can we dig down into some of those things? I'm not going to ask you to change your political party or preference, I promise. In fact, I, I, I'm glad for the diversity that we have within this church. I think it's fantastic. I would love to see even a broader diversity within our church in terms of culturally as well. But I just want you to think a little differently as a Christian. Can I ask you to do that today? Can we ponder that thought? See, the question I want to ask is, don't answer out loud, all right? Mm -mm, don't want to hear it is do you want to do this? Disagree politically and love unconditionally. Maybe a better way to say it is, you know, we all aspire to, but the question is, is can you disagree politically and love unconditionally? That's the harder part. Not just tolerate. Some of us tolerate well. Some of us not so well, right? Not just tolerate. Not, not be nice with the, the rolled eye as you walk away, Right? Y'all thought I didn't watch some of that, no? I see, I see. But to literally disagree and love unconditionally. Let me ask it differently, all right? A little more to the point of this service and, and what we're doing. And if you notice, I'm sticking real close to my notes because I want to be really careful because I, I want to make sure I get to where I'm trying to get to today. So that's why I'm hanging right here today. Here's the question. Put it just a little differently. Are you willing to elevate... Your politics through the filter, excuse me, evaluate your politics through the filter of our historical collective Christian faith. Are you willing to evaluate politics through your collective Christian faith rather than creating a version of faith that supports your politics? Ooh, now he's meddling. Pastor, what are you doing? Are you willing to evaluate your, your, your current politics through the filter of our Christian faith and who we really are, rather than creating a version that fits really well with my politics, okay? Which is really what most Christians do, to be honest with you. It's what we all do. I mean, I'm guilty of it, you're guilty of it, we all do it. In fact, next week I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what, and that is that Jesus, everybody wants a piece of Jesus, right? It doesn't matter which party you support. It doesn't matter which party it is. Every party wants to support Jesus. They all use scripture. We can find scripture to back up most everything that our party believes. It doesn't matter. Uh, it's the way it is. And all parties strive to support their agenda through the context of the Bible, right? It's just, it's the reality. We've seen it. It's out there. And that's okay. The real issue, the real issue is, are you and am I willing, not can you, are you willing to follow Jesus or the mission of the church, which is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus, right? 
even when doing so creates space between you and your party. And I'm talking to any and every party. Between the party's platform, between maybe a party's candidate, most Christians are not able to do that. Especially in this election climate that we're currently in, and it just seems so in, crazy and insane. It's just so easy to rush to divide. It's so easy to wave our banner and our flag, and it's just so easy to assume that Jesus is in alignment with our particular party. And I'm talking to all parties, not just any one particular party. Apparently, Jesus saw this coming. No, not the election. <laughs> That's not what I'm referring to. The division. Jesus saw the division coming. See, after Jesus had the Last Supper, which we celebrated that moment he had as, as we took communion today with the, the disciples, and in John's book uh, that he wrote, Jesus had a prayer before his arrest. And we're going to see two things inside of that prayer. And this is where I want to begin to dive into the Word. So get your Bibles. Get your Bibles. Turn to the book of John right now. We're going to get there. The first thing we're seeing is that he prays for us. Jesus prays for us. And the second thing is that Jesus had a prayer request. What? Jesus? Yeah, can you imagine that? It's an odd thought. You know, they're sitting in a circle and, hey, anybody got a prayer request? And Jesus is like, yeah, I've got one. Jesus is praying to his dad, to his father, his heavenly father, and he, he says, God, I, I really need you to help me with this one. See, we see that Jesus asked the father for something very specific. And it has everything to do with all of us as believers today. We're going to go to John chapter 17 today. And we're going to start in verse 1. And we're going to hop skip kind of down through that, that, that book or that chapter, okay? So John 17, 1. And here's, here's what Jesus says. He says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. He's preparing himself for what's ahead. The hour in which God was most glorified, that would be the crucifixion, we would have been most horrified in our lives. We would have looked away, but God never looked better because he sent his son for you and for me. If we skip down to verse 11, we see where he continues to pray and he says, I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world and I'm coming to you. And what's next is amazing. Hang with me right there. Most Christians don't know this. Here's the prayer request that he gave right here. Check this out. Holy Father, he says, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave, so that, pause right there. That's a purpose clause. He's asking the Father to protect these disciples. Protect them from what? Protect them so that they, they, they were facing arrest. They were facing they were facing the death of martyrdom, so Jesus probably was most likely asking to protect them from that, right? Mm -mm. That's not it. That's not it. He's not praying for physical protection here. He says, so that, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be, and this is the one prayer request for the first century followers, here's what he wanted. It wasn't protected it was, and they were facing certain death. There was things colliding in them on every side. He says that they may be so that they may be one as we are one. Jesus is asking the Father not to protect them from all the, th the physical things that are going to happen. He says, protect them, Lord, that they may be one like you and I, that they may be together. He's most concerned with unity of the believers of the faith, with oneness. Protect them, Father, Son, unity. You know, you think about that, that they are connected on an amazing level. And this is what Jesus wants for us, to be connected as one, as the fellowship of believers of Jesus Christ. Then he prays for you. He prays for me. He prays for us. He knew that if we would remain unified as the ecclesia, the church, we would be unstoppable. If you skip down to verse 20, he prays for you, me, us, and he says this in verse 20. My prayer is not for them, and that's the disciples. You catch that. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message. See, it's not just about these 12 right here, or 11 at that point. It's not for them. He's praying for 
all those who will believe in me through their message. That's the next generation, and that's the next generation, and that's the next generation all the way to us to today. And what do you think he prays for us? The answer is not what we pray for us. You know what I'm saying? Because we pray for a lot of things that we want. But that's not what Jesus was praying. My mind thinks none of us Jesus followers have ever asked God what Jesus asked God for, which may explain a big part of why we have the problem we have in our society today, right? Because we're worried about our rights and our things and our stuff. But Jesus wants something greater. Maybe if the church, maybe me, if I was asking for this, the world might be a little different. He says, going on down there in verse 20, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them, he's talking about all of them. In the, in the first century, that means the, the Jews, that means the Gentiles, that means the Romans, that means the Samaritans, the women, the slaves, the freedmen, the soldiers. That means the tax collectors, the educated, the wealthy, the unwealthy, everybody. That all of them. In the 21st century, if I were to put it there, it would mean the black men and the brown men, the white people, the rich people, the middle class, the single, the married, the children, the privileged, the Republicans, the Democrats, the independents, the libertarians, the librarians, the indecisive, right? All of them, pray that all of them, somehow, that all of them may be, what is it? One. This sounds impossible, doesn't it? Jesus was convinced that for the sake of this mission, for the sake of this mission, this was critical for the success of what he wanted to see in the world. It was imperative that we were one which means we should be intentional about making that a reality in the church. This is red letter stuff, folks. This is Jesus talking. This isn't somebody else saying this. This is the Son of God saying this. It doesn't come naturally to us, does it? Okay, the rest of us it does, but to one or two of us it doesn't. That's why he prayed for it. He prayed for that because he knows it's not natural for us to do that. If we look at verse 21, it says, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that, another preparatory clause, purpose clause there. Do you know why he asked for oneness? So that we would get along? Nah. It doesn't have anything to do with us. It's what he wanted to do through us. There can, be, there can be a lack of unity in the local church, and the local church will survive. But without unity, the purpose of Jesus Christ cannot be accomplished within the local church. Without unity, it fails. You know, if we jump back into Proverbs, and I was, I was looking at that this morning, Proverbs chapter oh, 6, in verse 16, 17, 18, and 19, let me just pull this out real quick for you. And it says, there are six things the Lord hates. Oh, seven that are detestable to him, he says. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked schemes, feet that are quick to rush to evil, a false witness who pours out lies. And the one I, I don't like the most is this one right here. It says, a man who stirs up dissension among the brothers. Brothers is believers, Right? If we're not one and somebody's stirring this up, ooh, boy, I feel badly for that person. That's what Jesus hates. All of them would be one. It doesn't come naturally for us. It doesn't at all. So if we look on in verse 21, it says, that they may also be in us so that the world, that's people outside the faith, that's people who are not believers in Jesus Christ. Different worldviews, those who roll their eyes and drive by when they go by the church. So that when they see the unity within the churches, in spite of the diversity within the church, we win. Does that make sense to you? So, so may they also be in us so that the world may believe. That means the world may be convinced that you have sent me. 
He was asking his father to nudge us toward what he commanded us to do earlier that same evening. In spite of the diversity, in spite of cultural dif- differences, in, in spite of their upbringing being different, different views, different politics, Jesus wants us to love one another above all else. Right? Oh boy, your toes are sore today, aren't they? Mm-hmm. Pastor's meddling. If we skipped over to John backwards to John 13, verses 34 and 35, keep your finger on the 17, though, because we're coming back there. He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. As Jesus has loved the church, so we are called to love one another. This is a new command. This wasn't a suggestion this wasn't a, hey, if you can kind of work it out, it'd be kind of nice. You know what? You know, I know y'all don't get along. This was a command from God. A command. Again, it's not about us. It's about the mission that God wants to do through us for the world. He says in verse 5, By this, the fact that we love one another in spite of our differences, by this, the fact that we don't have infighting and that we don't have uh, disunity within the church, by this... Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another as I, Jesus, have loved you. And he says, please, Father, please, please help them to do this. This is going to be so hard for them. If we go back over to 17, where Jesus' prayer in verse 22 is where we left off. Go back there for a minute. He says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, Jesus says, I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete what? Complete unity. Imagine that. Not political unity. Unity of purpose. There's a difference. Here it is again. It's not about us. He says in verse 23, then, if we can get to that, the complete unity, then, The world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as I, excuse me, as you have loved me. Dad, he says, everything evolves around how well they do this. If they can get a hold of this, Dad, we can change the world. It can happen in a great way. And after the resurrection, it happened. The church launched and they began to love one another. And through that love, it went out to everybody. It went with one purpose, one purpose, to make disciples of all nations, one purpose and one message. That's how they went out. And Jesus, the Messiah, the King, who came to reverse the order of things, he died. He died for his subjects in order to create an on-ramp to the Father. They went into the streets of Jerusalem with this one thing, one command, to love one another the way Jesus loved. It's a tall order, isn't it? But not an impossible order. Your candidate will win or lose based on how America votes on Tuesday. But this church, this church, the church, and when I say the church, I'm talking about the church universal, that every congregation that calls Jesus Christ Lord will win or lose based on our behavior every day between now and then and every day after the election. The response following the vote will show the world whether or not what we know to be true love is real. Boy, this is tough. The church wins or loses. Our community of Lebanon wins or loses. Our families win or lose. Our nation wins or loses based on how we love on others who are not like us. How we respond to individuals moving forward. That's why. That's why. Here it is. You ready? We must not let anything divide us. We must not let anyone divide us. Remember, it was Christianity that shaped Western civilization. Would you agree with me on that? 
Christianity shaped Western civilization. It wasn't American politics. It wasn't Democrats and it wasn't Republicans. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, Libertarians or anyone else. It was the teachings of Jesus that laid the, the groundwork for our modern sense of justice, fairness, and dignity. Would you agree with me on that? And that's for every individual, isn't it? Throughout our very short history as a nation, we have gotten it wrong. Both current parties have gotten it wrong, right? You can say yes. Okay, good. Some of you are like, oh, no. Yes, it's true. During the short history of us as a nation, several political leaders from both parties have fell short morally. They have fallen short in their leadership. During our short history, we have seen party after party who, who, who ended up needing to shut down. Do we got any, you know, they, they, their whole party closed down. Do we have any Federalists left in the House? Any Whigs that are out there? Some of you are like, what in the world is that? Look at your history, right? So the question is, here it is. Why would we, why would we, as followers of the eternal king, why would we allow ourselves to be divided by temporary elected officials? Why would we, as, as followers of the eternal king, allow ourselves to be divided by political platforms, by temporary political systems, by lesser kings? Why would we allow that to happen? Why would we allow a political view, how we perceive politics, the way we, uh, that, something that we might outgrow, right? How many of you probably have a different view today than you had years ago, right? Why would we allow a temporary political view? Why would you allow it to divide us from a living, breathing you? The you beside you. The you next door to you. The you that you're related to. Why would we not fight for and struggle for and sacrifice for the unity that our King, Jesus Christ himself, prayed for over us as a believers in Jesus Christ. He prayed that over us. Why would we allow these temporary things to divide us? So, do you want to do this? Where am I at? Ooh, good. Do you want to do this? Sorry, I had to look at my clock. It's, it's a lot easier to look at it here than it is up there. It's like, uh, no. So, anyway, do you want to do this? See, this is God's will for you. This is God's will for us. This is God's will for every church. Because this is what Jesus prayed for. Unity. Together. So I have two suggestions for us today. And, and I'm actually going to be wrapping up in just a second here. I have two suggestions for us, all right? Would you pray like Jesus prayed? Would you be willing to step out and do that and pray like Jesus prayed? Here, here it is. Here's how he prayed, all right? First, first thing he did is he prayed for oneness, didn't he? He prayed for oneness. It, his prayer went something as simple as like this. Heavenly Father, make us one so we can influence many. Wouldn't that be a summation of what he really prayed? It's, it's not nearly as elaborate and, and wonderful as what Jesus said, but really that was the whole thing. Ma make us one so that we can influence many. Would, would that be a, a, good, a good summation of what Jesus had prayed? And we pray that for the local church. It's not about church growth. It's about unity of the collective body of Christ coming together. If we can stay as one, churches all across this town, all across this state, all across this nation and around the world, if we can stay as one, we can influence the world like the disciples did. So should we be praying this daily in our lives? This was the prayer of our Savior, who hours later died for us. This was one of the last things he did before he went to the cross. So today, here's what I want to do. All right, this is really simple. I'm just going to ask you to pray this prayer with me. It's real simple. We're just going to say it out loud. Will you say it with me together? Let's pray this. Say, Heavenly Father, make us one so we can influence many. Let's say it again. Let's just say it all together. Here we go. Heavenly Father, make us one so we can influence many. It's so simple. And that's what Jesus has called us to do. 
And, and, you know, to do this, the second thing we have to look at is that we have to look for an opportunity to love unconditionally someone with whom you disagree with politically. <laughs> you see the smile right here? <laughs> I want you to look for someone to love unconditionally someone whom you disagree politically. And you're like, I don't even know anybody I don't disagree with politically. What are you talking about? <laughs> That's part of the problem. <laughs> right? You can laugh right there. It's okay. You know, it's real. Some of you are like, oh, that hurts. But man, yeah, you're right. See, this may be harder than it normally is. And the reason it is is, is that it will, our light will shine brighter than it normally does. Because in this climate, when you've got darkness all around you and this division that's happening, how many of you know that the darker something is, the light shines brighter, right? Now, some of you are thinking, Pastor Kevin, you are naive. You are naive if you think this is going to make a difference. Now, this is what Jesus called us to do. This isn't what I'm calling you to do. This is what Jesus called us to do before going to the cross. Let me tell you what naive is, all right? Here's naive. You ready for this? A first century rabbi from a nowhere town standing out in the middle of the hot Syrian sun with 12 men, uneducated men around him, making this audacious promise when he said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. That might sound a little naive, right? I mean, but here he is, Jesus, standing in that hot sun with 12 guys around him, and he makes this statement, and these guys are like, I'm just a fisherman. What are you talking about? We're going to rule. You know, no. I mean, and yet, look what happened. Look what accomplished through what God put into people and men to do. When we're doing it right, God can be a part of that. Unity. Oneness. Are we a part of it? And our oneness is the key to fueling it in our generation. See, Jesus did build his church. And, he, and it didn't. Hades didn't overtake it. It happened. He prayed it. And it happened. So here's what I want you to do. All right, I want you to disagree politically, love unconditionally, and pray for unity. Disagree politically, love unconditionally, and pray for unity. Say that with me. Let's disagree politically, love unconditionally, and pray for... That's the way it is. Stand up with me, if you will. I got one last thing I want to mention to you as we close. Most importantly, don't want to miss this one, all right? Here it is. You ready for this? Most importantly, don't miss next week's installation of politics and religion. Let's pray. Father, I pray today that as we have seen this, heard this, faced this, we've been stirred to something that maybe we've forgotten about. Because I think, Lord, inside of each of us, we all desire to be in unity with fellow believers in Christ. I think within each of us is this desire, but, Lord, we get so caught up in the stuff around us. And we start championing our claws and what we want to do. And so, God, I just pray that you would bring us back to the essence of what you asked us as believers in you to do, and that is to be one as the Father and the Son are one that we could elevate our faith in Christ above our politics. But Lord, you are so much more important than any temporary thing that's going on in our politics today. You are the most important of all, God. And you call us to unity as believers in Jesus Christ. And I know, God, that I have probably stepped on some toes today. And I know, Lord, that I have stirred a pot that's most people don't dare to touch. But today, God, I pray that you you would sink it into our hearts, Lord, how important it is that when the world is falling apart all around us, they still see the church together regardless 
of the biases and differences that each may have and the stances that each has. We still are one in you, oh God. Let the world see that as we move into next week and out of next week, Lord. Let us, let us see the church as one. The love and the unity that's there in spite of our choice differences. Because God, that's what you've called us to do. So Lord, I just pray that today over every single person here. Lord, I, I pray this for those outside of this church today that God, they would see you and desire to be one with you and other believers. We pray this, oh God, in your name. Amen. Amen. This morning, before you leave, if you need prayer for anything today, I would love to be able to pray with you. I'll be down here at the front. If you need to come, just spend some time. If, if the election is, is worrying you and, and you need to come pray, come pray. I encourage you, whether or not you come pray today, that you be praying up until the election and after the election because our nation needs it more now than ever before. Please be praying. But if you need prayer today for anything, come on down. I'll be happy to pray with you today before you leave. The altars are open. God bless you. Thank you for being here. We'll look for you again next week.